Thank you all for joining us here at New Lab. I'm Sean Stewart. I'm the CEO here. Thanks for coming out on a cold Wednesday night. Uh, tonight we kick off the third part in our existential medicine series, tonight on the genetic horizon. We're thrilled to be here in partnership with J-Labs and EY, and thank you all for attending. Tonight's topic is the first time people have called the front desk uh, complaining about access to tickets, so it's been a real uh, topic that people are excited to hear about. We expect to cover everything from CRISPR gene-edited babies being born in China through to the uh, changes to the human genome and the ethics behind those. And so we're thrilled to have an esteemed panel joining us today. We'd start by introducing our moderator, Jana Levin. Jana has been a huge friend and advocate for the New Lab community since opening. She's the director of sciences as well as the, uh, the chair of the studio of sciences at PioneerWorks. She's also a professor at the Barnard School of Columbia University on physics and astronomy. And she's an astrophysicist herself, a theoretical astrophysicist, which you need one of those for any good party. So please join me in welcoming Janet to the stage along with our panel. It's, um, it's so lovely to see everyone here. Um, I always say my favorite part of these talks is when I get to study, <laughs> when I have to study CRISPR and biology. As a, a physicist, I, I always imagine nature at her strangest and most radical. I always imagine that to be in the sky, right? Like black holes and the Big Bang and dark matter and extra dimensions. Until CRISPR. <laughs> CRISPR was really something that threw me. And I have been absolutely mesmerized by the biology and the physics of that mechanism and the promise of, of the benefits of CRISPR and also somewhat terrifying dystopia of what might go wrong, right? And I think we'll talk about this tonight. And while everyone's warning about the imbalance between the benefits, let's say, of AI and the existential threat of AI, out of the corner of my eye, I'm wondering about the possible benefits that might well exceed that of CRISPR and also the existential threat of CRISPR. Um, I'm so delighted to have this group of people who I handpicked <laughs> to be here tonight to talk about not the cosmological horizon, but the genetic horizon. So let me please introduce Michal Preminger from Johnson & Johnson Innovation, Sam Sternberg, who is a professor in uh, biochemistry and molecular biophysics at Columbia, and Ali Brevanlu, how am I doing? <laughs> I've been working on it backstage. Um, who is the head of stem cell biology and molecular embryology at Rockefeller. Please join me in welcoming our guests. So this is a frightening topic because it's moving so fast. And Sam, I wanted to start with you because we have this video here that sort of lays the ground for CRISPR. Can you talk us through this, please? This should not be frightening. This is, so this CRISPR technology. What, viruses CRISPR, attacking a cell is not is, frightening? This I'm is frightened. a super cool part about CRISPR. <laughs> so this is actually where it was discovered. It's bacteria and the viruses that infect bacteria. And basically, how do they, how do these hosts defend against that threat? So I wish I'd I'm gonna been start talking over. earlier. Can I start over? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Let, me, let me just talk before the movie starts. So, yeah. and so then, many okay, of you good. may not realize that bacteria, um, we think that they're everywhere, but actually the viruses that infect them are about 10 times more abundant, and they're the most prevalent biological entity on Earth by many orders of magnitude. There's something like a trillion, trillion viruses for every grain of sand on Earth. Every bacteria in the ocean is constantly being assaulted by like 10 to 100 times more viruses, and they've done some statistics. Actually, the ocean's biomass, the microbial biomass, turns over about 25 to 30 percent every day from deadly infections that kill bacterial cells in the ocean environment. So this is, a, you should think about all the bacteria growing on your skin, all the bacteria in your gut, they're constantly being threatened by these tiny little viruses that look exactly like these little Martian uh, spacecrafts, which are similar to human viruses. I mean, they have genetic material, they have proteins. Um, and so just like humans have evolved immune systems to fight off bacterial pathogens, viral pathogens, bacteria have done the exact same thing. They've had to yep. survive this threat. At the same time, we, there's been an argument about whether or not we consider a virus alive. 
Yeah, I, don't, I still don't know how I feel about that. I always use the word biological entity because it's conveniently vague. So um, the, the distinction being that <laughs> the distinction being that it cannot reproduce on its own. On its own. But so, then there are actually cells that are um, obligate endosymbionts that also cannot reproduce unless they're And aren't host. we sort of like that too? Because we yeah, can't possibly survive without our bacteria. Because we also need bacteria. the microbiome, and you know, there's all these interesting facts like. There are about one to ten times more bacterial cells than human cells. If you just do the numbers, we have about in our bodies. You in mean our bodies. specifically, right? So our biomass is like we're just, we just live here. Not biomass, number of cells, because of course a human cell is a lot bigger than a bacterial uh, okay. cell. But if you just count how many, there's about the same number. The uh, the estimations are one to one to ten to one. But we are a huge reservoir of bacteria and we require them. So yeah, I mean, it's interesting what, what do we consider a, a free-floating, freestanding organism. So I think you're right, Jana, that uh, if you asked a virus, they would not consider themselves less life than we are. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. <laughs> so there's like Let's there's, hope we don't have that conversation anytime soon. <laughs> so there's, there's the scary parts of CRISPR that we can talk about, but so my backstory on CRISPR was thinking about this very fundamental and simple question, which is how do these bacteria withstand this ceaseless assault from viruses? What kinds of molecular strategies have they developed to fight off these kinds of invasions? And so CRISPR, the, the wild thing is that CRISPR was discovered about 12 years ago, 2007 was the kind of uh, groundbreaking paper. It was done by a yogurt company trying to make their yogurt bacterial strains more virus resistant. You don't want to grow vats of, of yogurt and have those cultures dying from viruses. Um, and now I think in the last 12 years, we've gone from this very interesting basic research discovery to, I mean, human babies born whose DNA has been completely altered we'll with CRISPR. We'll get there. Don't, hey, that's a whole talk done. Is Thank you, what? everybody. <laughs> was that, was, are there spoilers <laughs> here that I'm not supposed to give No, we, we have a, whatever pace we want to take. Do you okay, want to Okay, so now I'm going to talk through, through. So this is basically okay. a virus. This is obviously an animation, but the virus will infect the cell, similar to a human virus. But the viral capsid stays outside. What penetrates is the DNA that gets injected. So at this point, there's maybe 10 to 15 minutes. So why is it injecting its DNA? What is it after when it's doing no, this? Those, the DNA is the instructions of life, baby. So is it That's trying right. to kill the bacterium, or is it trying to take it over? It's trying to kill the bacterium. Or is it trying to reproduce? I mean, I mean that, it, will what, kill, it seems it will to be kill, too It will kill the cell in the process. Conflicting purposes. It will kill the cell in the process of reproducing. There's, there's caveats to that. They can lie dormant in the genome, similar to HIV, which integrates into the genome and persists. But the, the key point is that to prevent the replication part, the best way to destroy a virus is to recognize that viral DNA is being formed. It's fundamentally different than the bacterium's own chromosome. And so CRISPR is basically an elaborate molecular strategy to recognize DNA from an invading virus in a very specific way. It's all about being specific, because if you're sloppy, you end up cutting your own DNA and not the viral DNA, and now you've got cells just committing suicide. So it's highly specific, and the end result is exactly this, a sliced apart DNA, mm -hmm. and with the DNA cut in half, essentially, this virus can no longer replicate its genome, and the infection fails, and the bacteria win. So, so it's the immune system of the bacteria. It's an immune system. That's exactly, exactly what it is. the same, our, our blood is defending against foreign invaders. And I would even say it's even more elaborate than what we use. Bacteria are way smarter than humans. So this is fascinating to me. So it, right, it, it inserts the viral DNA into its own genetic strain so that later, like a vaccination card, as I've heard both of you say. Should I quiz you? Do you should I quiz you to see if you know the acronym CRISPR? Uh, yes, um, clustered, regularly, interspa interspaced, wait, uh, the S you I always forget, um, what's the S, don't tell me, space, space, um, no. palindrome, short, short. short palindrome. How did I do? And you're, repeat, missing, you're repeating, missing the R. Repeating palindrome. <laughs> Fuck. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> uh, if she swore first, then I can definitely swear next. Okay, good. Now I'm, now I'm relaxed. So... Ali, this is an amazing thing. So the bacteria uh, have their own vaccination mechanism that is inc more sophisticated, as Sam has said, than our own, as far as we can tell. They put the DNA 
in their own DNA so that later if the invader comes back, they can send out drones to annihilate it, right? So when you heard about this, what was your reaction? I mean, this must have been, you're a, you're a stem cell biologist, you're an embryo, you, know, you study embryonic stem cells. This must have been stunning to you and unexpected or not. Well, I'm was, curious. It was beautiful for what it was. And the idea that somehow a microorganism can defend against foreign invaders in ways that at least I could never imagine before the idea that you can face any enemy coming from outside and regardless of the DNA sequence, you will actually develop a strategy to go against it and protect yourself, not only within the context of the first invasion, but keeping a memory of that invasion so that later on, if it occurs, again, just like vaccination in humans, you will recognize the pathogen and you will fight against it. So that was beautiful in terms of biological function at such a macroscopic level with such an amazing resolution where you can actually manipulate the DNA and it's individual units that we call the nucleotides. It was gorgeous, but at the same time, I think I and others realized that this system can be rerouted or manipulated to accomplish things that are different than what nature has made it to accomplish. So if a bacteria knows how to edit the genome of an invading virus in order to protect itself, then perhaps that technology can be used to edit the genome of all organisms, not only bacteria, and then it's no longer a natural phenomenon in the way we describe natural aspects of the immune defense system of a bacteria, but perhaps a very highly sophisticated molecular tool that can be used to edit the genome of a variety of organisms way beyond bacteria. Right, so that is a really huge, stunning leap to go from, oh, you know, lovely scientific observation of this discovery to, wait a minute, these are surgical tools. And they're surgical tools that can be applied in the human genome if exactly. we're astute. Exactly. And that is just, that, that, did not, that did not come immediately, right? That, that, and you studied in Doudna's group, Sam. So, so Jennifer Doudna is one of the pioneers of realizing, wait a minute, I can reprogram this to work in the human cell in the human genome. And that is just starts to become, the implications of that become stunning, not just because you have this incredible surgical tool, but because it's cheap and easy, right? Yeah. So first of all, congrats on saying Doudna, because so many people say Doudna, it's amazing. <laughs> um, so I'm always impressed with That's people that say That's a terrible pronunciation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think what I always like to credit, you know, CRISPR gets a lot of, um, should get a lot of credit for making gene editing, you know, so um, democratic in terms of anyone with very meager uh, resources can pretty much be setting CRISPR up in their own lab or, you know, there are do-it-yourself CRISPR kits you can buy online I now. bought one online and I turned yeast pink. Nice. I mean, and then I threw it in my garbage, and I just felt socially, like, really irresponsible about the whole thing. And now it's probably living in some, like, I know, some it's taking over somewhere. right now. Like, it's probably encroaching on New Lab as we yeah. speak. Yeah. But, you know... I saw some interesting cats outside. Oh. <laughs> you know, there, there was this... You know, New York's got folks like Maria Jason at Memorial Sloan Kettering. She was one of the pioneers realizing that... If you can harness an enzyme like the CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme that's kind of schematized up here, to cut DNA in a human cell, that's actually, it would seem like that's not a good thing because you think cutting DNA, well, in a bacterium, that's how you kill the viral genome. In a, in a human cell or more generally a eukaryotic cell, more complex organisms, it turns out that cutting DNA acts as a trigger for various kinds of repair that allow you to end up introducing permanent changes to the genome. And so there was actually two decades of work developing other kinds of enzymes or tools to make precise cuts at a single location in the genome. And so, you know, CRISPR doesn't get any glory for revolutionizing that idea. It just turns out that the way it works is so much easier and more powerful to apply that it kind of slotted right into this two decade long 
journey to develop these kinds of tools and then along came something that nature had already solved and we just needed to, to make that connection and put it all together. Now, Michal, I'm interested because as somebody in the big pharma industry and world, when you heard this, and you know, this is unlike a pill, right? It's unlike a, a medicine in the conventional sense. And yet it, the medical applications are clearly, like the mind races to keep up with all, it's like, it's like flashing by your eyes, all of the potential medical applications. So how does uh, a big pharma respond to something like this? So, so let me maybe just uh, take a step back and, uh, and share um, my, my initial reaction to CRISPR uh, when I was actually not in big pharma, I was uh, at Harvard and responsible for um, mobilizing in, in, in innovation and discoveries from the lab to become products. And what CRISPR did is, is really cut, uh, you know, decades of, of work into, you know, or, or I would say years of work into days. So when we, you know, at the time, um, when you wanted to understand the function of a new gene, or you, you know, it, it used to be a PhD thesis, right? And then it became maybe something that takes a year, and suddenly, you know, within three weeks, you 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 covered, you know, twenty thousand genes, and you knew exactly what was going on. So, so, so the revolution, in terms of the tool that it is, I think, I think. Uh, you know, we can focus on the downstream applications, but upstream, this is revolutionizing our ability to uh, identify new um, new biological mechanisms and disease mechanisms. So, you know, and now back to being uh, in, in a big health company, I think that, uh, you know, beyond the immediate use of, the, of CRISPR technology in a drug, I think there is a great flow of, of new... Uh, treatments and, and new insights into um, into human disease that that are you know being uh, kind of are transforming medicine every day. So this is one thing to say in in favor. And I, I you know in general I, I have many many favorable things about CRISPR. I will also say that for me maybe Sam you it sounds like for you too and and Ali. Um, there is a continuum of discovery that um, that is, you know, as science as unfolds and then as the tools that we're acquiring, um, you know, are are getting more and more sophisticated. I personally think that CRISPR is, you know, is um, yet another amazing discovery, but not the last one, not the first one that revolutionizes our our ability to, you know, develop new ways to. To address disease, and um, and I think that uh, we will see that uh, you know we will find other things as well. Um, you know, I, I was uh, at, at one of the early genomics companies, and uh, and we you know we were um, probably destroying a lot of value, uh, patent wise and otherwise, by finding drug targets, and um, and and uh, you know in in the decade and a half that went by since then, so many new tools came about, but. For, for large companies that are um, developing products through a very strict regulatory path, I think that um, CRISPR uh, will start uh, participating in applications that uh, use it um, you know, to uh, enable other medication. And some examples, so J&J announced uh, you know, a couple months ago a, a collaboration with uh, Locus Biosciences down in North Carolina that is developing uh, a phage, which is you know one of those Martian things that we saw earlier, that is um, that is um, that carries a particular type of CRISPR uh, with the aim of uh, of uh, basically um, uh, eliminating pathogens that are involved in specific disease. So it is um, it is a way to harness the technology in a very controlled way. Uh, and I think in general, I think the, the, um, the, the path forward for CRISPR through uses that are highly regulated, that are you know, put in the hands of, uh, of companies that are responsible, that, that know exactly how to address, how to make sure that safety is, um, is uh, measured very carefully, that uh, you know, all of the, um, 
all of the regulatory pathways are, you know, all the check, the boxes are checked is, is a great way to take this forward. And I think we see applications in, uh, you know, agriculture, biotech, we see applications in animal health, we see applications of CRISPR in, in uh, modifying cells outside the body for CAR T to fight cancer and so on. So it's, it's becoming prevalent and very useful. So um, clearly there are uh, applications in progress for living adults where their uh, CRISPR is being used to edit uh, the genome of living adults. That's already staggering. I think for the context of this conversation, I was particularly interested in the embryonic aspect and editing uh, before birth. And so I think this is really important for Ali's research. And so Ali, I wanted to ask you to talk us through this, which is from your research. Okay, so maybe I can also say a few words before we launch. Okay, uh, we can, I'm, I'm, we can, I'm totally we can trigger launch. happy, sorry. We can, no, no, we can, we can. Um, so so uh, CRISPR-Cas9 can be used for utilitarian outcome, which is beautiful, you know, curing diseases, coming up with new uh, resistance, coming up with better attributes of living organism, may it be plants or animals. But CRISPR can also be used for just gaining knowledge at the level and at the resolution that we could never imagine before. So I'm an embryologist. It's a pure research tool. Yeah, it's a pure research tool. So uh, I, I'm an embryologist, a molecular embryologist, which means that I'm interested in figuring out where do things come from. So all of us sitting in this room started with the, as a fertilized egg. The sperm entered the egg, and the Big Bang started, and something magical occurred, so all this beautiful crowd is sitting in front of me. And as you can imagine, this process has been fascinating humans from the beginning, and has always remained a very mysterious process. In fact, way even before thinking about human development, everybody who looked at the fertilized frog egg to turn into a tadpole, and then a tadpole to metamorphose into a frog, or or to see a bird hatch from an egg has always been a mesmerizing, magical aspect of life. And where things come from is something that has interested me for a long, long time. And, and this tool allowed me and my team f to go at the stages and at the times where we did not imagine we could ever have access to. Now, in, in study of embryos in animals or so-called model systems, may it be fish, frog, birds, rodents. We always try to extrapolate from what we learn from these to kind of mirror our own development. And there has been a limitation in this. For decades, embryologists have figured out how a bird makes its muscle and blood and how, how is that different than the way a, a mouse does it versus a, a primate. But we have never had access to looking directly into our own development to somehow validate what we think we know about the early molecular processes of development, to what extent is that relevant to human development. Obviously, you expect evolutionary conserved trait over millions of years, but you also expect species-specific traits. What makes us human is obviously different than what makes a rodent, a bird, a frog, or a fish. So for me, CRISPR-Cas9, and for my team, uh, is a tool that allows me to track things in real time. Uh, you can already imagine that if you're a human embryologist and you want to understand human development, your access to source of biological material is very limited. I don't have access to thousands of human embryos, and obviously there are ethical rules that, that needs to be followed correctly and, and, and appropriately, as the ones we were discussing earlier for CRISPR-Cas9. So we had to come up with an alternative way, uh, rather than using a natural uh, human egg or a human blastocyst, uh, my lab and my colleagues develop a system where we can generate artificial human embryos or the so-called synthetic human embryos. So the image what that was that word I missed it. Synthetic human embryos, artificial human oh, embryos. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Sorry. My accent gets no, in no, there. It's my fault. And so um, what you see behind you is one of the first examples of making a, a, a human embryo that is not the product of sperm and egg is not the way we have been developing. Uh, it's a human embryo that's made of human embryonic stem cells, and I'm not gonna go to technical details, but what I use CRISPR-Cas9 in this case is to figure out where the lineages come from. 
How does a cell inside of an embryo decide if she's going to be blood, bone, muscle, or brain, or skin? It starts from one cell. It's I mean, let's just starts, pause on that. I mean, that is just always, unbelievable. It starts always. on one cell. Yes. And it learns to differentiate, and to the, become other kinds of cells. Exactly. And that is just, even that proposition, very, very, very pre-CRISPR, is stunning. Yes. It and really so, is extraordinary. Where does the information come from? Where does, where she, does it come from? How does, how does it distinguish? Yeah. How Do does, you know yet? How, does how faith, does it, Ali? I will show how you. How does it? I will show you. I'll show you. So w where does faith come from? This is CRISPR-Cas9 tagging of the great-great-grandmothers of skin and brain in blue, the great-great-grandmothers of muscle, blood, and bone in red, and the great-great-grandmother of uh, liver and kidney and gut in yellow. So what you're seeing here, every single dot is an individual cell. And you can see this beautiful spatial organization. And the most amazing thing about this observation, which we could only do by using CRISPR-Cas9 to tag and trace individual cells. This is not uh, somehow eliminating a gene, modifying a gene, or adding something to the genome. This is just putting a tag in individual fates to ask where do they come from and where do they go. And what you saw very quickly is that patterning and establishment of fate in human embryos happens from outside toward the inside and not the other way around. Now this is in vitro, in glass. Is in vitro and grass. This is about. So this has no epigenetic phenomena. This is this isn't in the mother's womb with hormones and stuff influencing or differentiating the cells. This is nothing but the original cell in glass. Exactly. In fact, there is no maternal influence whatsoever here. And one and was. What day is this? How how many days? So are it depends on how you count time. Uh, oh God, that's my problem altogether. What are you a relativist? What the hell is going on here? <laughs> so, so when we talk about biological time, we count day zero as the time when the sperm enter the egg and the clock starts from that point onward. But when you are dealing with artificial or synthetic human embryos, time is in suspension really because you keep the cells within a given state that we call pluripotency. This is the state. This is a this is a situation where the cell has not decided what she is going to be. And you can maintain that state forever, indefinitely, and then upon a single stimulus, this whole domino effect starts and you generate this effects that is almost the reverse of throwing a pebble in water, when the waves start from the center and move out. Here the waves are moving from out to the center. It's as if you're playing the video backward. So time here is a relative definition of things. Uh, it depends on how you want to count it. But one thing that we have already evaluated is that this Artificial human embryos are growing at about 10 times faster speed than a normal human embryo. That's really fascinating. And also, I know from reading some of your articles that you discuss how little we actually understand about human embryology and the idea that we could edit the genome of a human embryo and understand the implications seems quite naive in that context. Um, the idea that all we need to do is sequence the genome and that's all that matters seems to me quite naive. I mean, we know this has to be implanted in a uterus and the uterus has influence of the mother and we don't really understand uh, beyond just sequencing. I mean, great, it's fantastic we've sequenced the human genome. That is spectacular, but, but we also, do we or do we not have to concede that we don't really understand the implications of that in the context, and if you could also define epigenetics in the context of, of the influence of the environment? Sure, so it used to be, uh, we used to think that if you resolve the linear information that's encoded in a DNA molecule, somehow you're gonna crack the code of the diversity of life and the function. It turned out surprisingly that we only have 25,000 genes, and I can assure you that 25... it was like three billion. Oh, uh, those are the nucleotide sequences, but oh. the coding, coding, coding sequences are about 25,000. <laughs> okay. And this is far uh, from enough to generate all the diversity in fate, in organ, never mind behavior or cognitive aspect of, of being a human. So something else had to play a game in this. So epigenetics, as you mentioned, the decorations of the DNA became as important as the sequence of the DNA itself. But perhaps more importantly, the appreciation that things are very combinatorial. It's not one gene, one function, but it's really the way the harmony of this expression is done. Imagine a, a keyboard and a piano where 
each each key is a gene, but you can play an infinite number of symphony and music based on a very num limited number of keys. And even more impressively, at least to me, and that came from the study of the human embryo, the appreciation that the silences between the notes are as important as the notes themselves. So in order to have the harmony and the synchronicity in, in coherent development, fate determination, cognitive behavior, you can play an infinite number of variation with 25,000 sets of keys. That description was music to me. I, I <laughs> love what you just said. That was, that was really well put. <laughs> And uh, Michal, when you hear people doing research on human embryos, and I know, Ali, you were very careful, despite this time dilation phenomena, which is tricky, to, to terminate your experiments prior to the sort of 14 to 16 day international rules. And, um, and, and it's unclear if those rules are, are the right rules to follow, but there has been this sort of international declaration that you should not perform experiments on embryos beyond that day. And Michal, when you hear this, what, I mean, do you get nervous? I mean, is there a path to sort of medical applications or, or pharmaceutical applications um, at this stage that are, you think are viable? Or is this something you stay away from, do you think? So, so I, I, think, uh, I think stem cell research has contributed and, and embryonic stem cell research has contributed a lot to the understanding of disease and it is important. I mean, one can ask, you know, as a society, we can ask ourselves the question of, you know, is it, is it um, reasonable that the rules of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the boundaries for what is right and wrong is si in science are controlled by scientists? I mean, I, I don't have an answer to this. I can ask the question. I think that when it comes to um, uh, creating, so, so uh, you know, I, I, will, I will probably not comment on how basic science should be regulated or not regulated. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely a very, very uh, big advocate for basic research. Um, and I think that the weirder it is, the more we probably can benefit from it. And I'll just use one example. I think that uh, we all recognize, for example, the, um, you know, the way in which humanity conquered HIV, uh, pretty much, right? I mean, we, you know, just a couple decades ago, um, we were uh, in the midst of a, of a devastating epidemic, and now it is a, it is a chronic state that is well controlled. Um, and, and how did this happen? It happened because some people like Ali and, and Sam had, you know, the, the interest, the curiosity to study these weird viruses that were, you know, conducting their lives uh, kind of in the wrong direction, going from RNA to DNA and, you know, what's going on there. And some, you know, some people got interested in this and were studying it just for the sake of studying it. Uh, and so when we realized that HIV was caused by a retrovirus, which is one of those weird things, uh, we were ready with the knowledge to go and very, very quickly develop drugs. So I think that, um, that uh, you know, the importance of, of basic research cannot be overemphasized. Um, when it comes to actually developing uh, a... a uh, treatments and products, I, I definitely think that uh, we need to apply the strictest regulation. And uh, I think that, uh, that um, at least in, in this country, it looks like uh, FDA is preparing itself. It is involved in this process. Um, and, and, I, and, and I think that, um, you know, what, uh, what we may be worried about, or, you know, you're expressing anxiety about is is more about situations in which people will not follow the rules. Um, but maybe I'll just say one, uh, one last thing. I think that, I, you know, I can't imagine, I was, I was thinking about it, you know, years ago, I was thinking, what was the reaction, you know, when, when somebody proposed to do IVF? I mean, it, right? <laughs> so let's talk about that. Yeah, exactly, so perfect. Sam, you but, wanna, do, can, do you wanna, uh, I, I won't start it until you tell me. I won't start this video until you tell me. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment quick, which I think will connect to the, the discussion involving CRISPR, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, but the 14-day rule, I mean, it's, it's not a rule. There's no law about it. It's an kind of an agreement. informal agreement, and I think that gets to the heart of, of the challenge with these questions is that, well, who decides um, 
who regulates it, especially when we're talking about issues that are international in scope. I mean, we'll get into some of the stories with embryos and, and CRISPR, or we can even go into other embryo modifications that have been um, done by physicians in New York, but you know the, the actual implantation was done outside the U.S. to circumvent FDA regulations. So you know mm -hmm. this is a problem bigger than just how one country will regulate a new technology. And many of these kind of accepted consensus, what is the plural of consensus? Consensus, I don't know. Consensus. Is it consensi? <laughs> consensus. I've never said that before. Consensus I? No, it's, I, I, I think it's consensus. <laughs> um, now I forgot what I was going to okay, say. Okay, anyway, <laughs> well, how about you talk us through this video? Because it's going to be beautiful. So, so this, is a, this is a video I borrowed from you. And this is a video I borrowed from, from YouTube, it, that's, probably. That's what, that's what scientific open source means. Yeah. And, so, and I don't um, actually do any work with embryos myself, yeah. but I mean, I, I use this in my slide deck when I'm, you know, bringing up this very real controversy that's, it's not, it's no longer a theoretical discussion. I mean, we, we talked about this in a book I wrote with Jennifer many years ago. Mm -hmm. I was contacted in 2013 by someone that wanted to start a company. She did start a company called Happy Healthy Baby, right on the kind of um, coattails of the first wave of CRISPR-Cas9 excitement when, you know, I think the first gene-edited mice had just been produced in a lab, and maybe the first reports of gene-edited primates, so non-human primates, those had been published. And she reached out to me out of the blue and pitched a company called Happy Healthy Baby, and she, you know, she was being backed by some kind of wonky tech people in San Francisco, and she basically said, like, do you want to jump on board? You're, you're finishing your PhD next year. How about this for your next step? So, uh, and, and this leads into this video. And, Are we ready? And, and so that was theoretical, but now it's, it's happened. And so this is just yeah, a video. I, I mean, this is how IVF would be done. You know, many IVF treatments, you now inject sperm inside of, a, of an oocyte, an egg cell. So on the left is kind of this. It is extraordinary to see it in action, right? I mean, you hear these words all the time that and this I, is done, and but I it's say something them, else to kind of see it. But I've, I've never, I mean, you, Have you, you ever actually done know this? about this, so I should really let you talk about the actual We procedure. do this We do this routinely you in do the this lab, routinely. actually. Yeah, so, 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 you're, so you're, it's exactly like. So it's piercing. How does it not ruin the cell? Right. Amazing. amazing. So, and, it's and, amazing. And, it's and, a very small thing. Well, and it, it, it doesn't ruin the cell. It takes preparations before you get to this stage, obviously. You, <laughs> You're not just randomly like, You have the good touch, you know, the fine touch. It's, it's not like, let's add some salt and pepper and put it in the <laughs> No, it, 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 I mean, so obviously the medium There's in which... There's some delicacy. Yeah, you see a, a, let's a, a do it big, again. big fat pipette on this side of the screen. That's mm -hmm. a suction vacuum that holds on. Otherwise, mm -hmm. this, this egg will be running all around the place and turning around. It would be right. impossible to penetrate and with the needle. Mm -hmm. And as Sam said, what you're doing is you inject the sperm. Nowadays, you don't even need a whole sperm. You can let go of the tail and, in fact, let go of the head wow. and just inject the nucleus with the DNA information, and that's good enough to wow. create fertilization. And then within 24 hours or so, this cell will start dividing to, for you, I think you will see a video of that uh, uh, from my lab after, after this. But this is the beginning of the whole situation of, and that was mid-late 70s where IVF was developed. And it's a very interesting story, originally in Colombia, your home in New Not York. Colombia, South America. No, no, Columbia uh, University. Uptown. Yeah, okay, uptown. Yeah, okay. that's, that's a crazy story. <laughs> I, I read call, a book about that. I call that. it Upstate yeah. Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, so that was a Manhattan. really insane story. That was a very bizarre thing where things went very wrong, not because the science was not going well, but because there was this a fear reaction from the scientific community, actually, not even from outside, where uh, without citing any names, or, you know, somebody with authority at Columbia came and said, that's it, you know, this, and actually broke the tubes and stopped the experiment. Then the British scientists took over in the UK and, you know, the first IVF baby was born there successfully. Louis. Louis, exactly. And, Louis and Brown? Louis Brown, Louis yes. Brown. And so this was the beginning of a revolution in reproductive medicine because uh, couples who could not have kids now had an opportunity for the first time to be given that chance. And, and just like any new technology, especially in reproductive medicine or in CRISPR-Cas9, as we're talking about, the initial reaction was tremendous fear. 
Yeah. And people are like, oh my God, you know, test tube babies are creating humans by the thousands and, and you know, they're going to be Nazi armies work, working on First Avenue. <laughs> and, and, you know, this very bizarre thing that things are going to get out of control, which is again a natural reaction. You know, I think is uh, exactly the 200 year anniversary of M Mary Shelley's book, Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Almost, oh yeah. Last and, year, uh, yeah. And so nothing has changed really. The idea that somehow scientists are going to do an experiment and that experiment is going to get out of control, uh, not only to overwhelm, overwhelm the scientist himself or herself, but also the community mm -hmm. in which the science is operating is still there. So that was no different. The 14 day rule that you mentioned, and you mentioned actually the debate started at this moment. So the idea was if we can now make uh, babies outside of the womb without, you know, requirement for any sex, then uh, how, and we can follow them for about five days a week in, in a Petri dish, and then we transplant them back. Um, we have the technology to do it for about one week, and then we don't know what's going on when we put it back in there as a black box. But what if one day we had the technology of pushing it more than one week, past one week, how cool would it be to go? How far would it be okay to go? And the debate started, and somehow we landed in 14 days, and you're, you're absolutely right. In the United States, the 14 day is uh, a guidance from the National Academy of Science, um, but in the rest of the world is policy. So if you go past 14 days in Europe or in Southeast Asia, you're considered a criminal, mm -hmm. you go to jail. In the US, the debate is still open, and I think it's widening but up a little bit. you chose to respect that boundary. I did because for the first time we can't push that limit of one week to 14 mm -hmm. days and that right. was really mesmerizing right. and yes. a bit terrifying to be honest yes. with you. Yeah. So we had, I had to make a decision, uh, so we, we fertilized the eggs, we find a way to fool the eggs to think that they are in the uterus environment, so they attach and they continue the development and now we're looking at the origin of human development in a window of time that nobody else has seen past one week. And that was very amazing to see this uh, attribute that we call self-organization now in, in embryology, where things happen on their own rhythm without any requirement for extrinsic or outside information to guide it. And the toughest decision I had to make, and it was the clock was ticking, because here you have real time. Time zero is when the needle goes in. And so you can count where, how far you are from 14 days. And you see these beautiful structures developing in front of you. And the time comes where you have to call it you and you're past 13 days and now we're getting close to 14. Now, I want to ask you in a minute, not just at this moment, but I know that you, you described in that research seeing transient organs that we've never seen before. We know we have vestigial tails embryonically, we have gills, and they come and they go, but you discovered like a new organ that it's came and went. I think, I it's honestly wild. think we're much more beautiful the first months of our yes, development. We're, as we're, like, we're like all creatures. I think birds and after birth is kind of boring. Okay, well, we'll get, I know. God, it's so tedious. When is this going to be over? Um, so we, I did want to discuss Nana and Lulu here because this is a very big deal. Is that them? That's, that's those are not technically Nana and Lulu, but those are fertilized embryos. And we discussed that CRISPR was used in fertilized embryos just to see before the 14-day rule uh, what, you know, what the consequences were to study it as a research tool. And there were terrible deletions in the, in the genome, um, unexpected complex mutations, and um, and then there was, can you remind me of the name, He uh, Jinju? Zhangkui Hua. Zhangkui, Zhangkui. Uh, that's my Hua. attempt at the okay. Chinese pronunciation. Um, so um, He and Hua, Hua is his name, but some people pronounce it He. Right, but some people pronounce him He. It's confusing, because it's Yes, it's confusing. It happens to be the, yeah, the pronoun in English. Um, in secret, conducted experiments. Um, he was Stanford educated, Chinese born, scientist, but Stanford educated, um, had even alerted people that he was doing this, and they said it was reckless, you must stop, you cannot do this, but in secret, he not only uh, edited the genome of the embryos, he implanted them, and he saw them through to fruition, and he claims that there are twin girls that have been born, who have had their genome edited. It is absolutely the first time that anyone acknowledges in history that this has happened. Francis Collins, who's the head of the NIH, said it was uh, 
a reckless, I'm trying to remember his exact phrasing. He said, um, it was a misguided misadventure of the most dramatic sort. He called it shocking. And just to paint the picture even bolder, I mean, so there was about to be the second international summit on human gene editing in Hong Kong. This has been planned for years, maybe multiple years. You know, 2015 was the first international meeting to discuss the ethics, the regulation, safety concerns around the use of gene editing technologies in human cells, not just embryos, you know, also treatments for living patients, but I think the real impetus was the controversy over editing the germline. Germline's a term that's often used. Because it's is, inheritable. Because it's it inheritable. It can be passed on to the next generation. So that was the first meeting, and you know, there's been a lot of discussions, a lot of um, white papers, a lot of different governing bodies, so like stem cell societies, the National Academies put out a very lengthy report in 2017, many international bodies put out reports, and so everyone was building up to this second summit in December of 2018. And I remember being at home on a Sunday night, the, the eve before the, the kickoff of this international meeting, where I'm sure everyone had their slide decks, you know, on the next discussions about when would be the right time, what should be the criteria for when to move in this direction. And then there was a, a scoop from the AP News and also MIT Tech Review that it's happened. And then immediately he had actually, because the story got scooped before the, the summit, there were four or five YouTube videos that um, they were Dr. Very, ha, they were propaganda forward. Yeah, it was, it, it's a little, I, I watched them and it, it was a little, give me an uncomfortable feeling. I mean, yeah. he clearly was smiling. He's very and defensively advocating for the experiment, um, justifying what's been done, but there's no question that the international reaction was one of condemnation, um, condemnation and shock. Yeah. So there have um, been a lot of stories since then. I mean, he was, you know, there's a New York Times piece that he was potentially under house arrest, or at least he was in a... A, a, an apartment that was being guarded and it wasn't clear if those guards were Chinese police or some kind of secret agency or, or protection for him. So Is it clear that, okay, so, so he was editing specifically because the father um, had HIV and he was editing so that the embryos had the CCR5 gene, which is seen in North Europeans, which is natural, which, which people who are naturally immune um, to HIV, they have other vulnerabilities, but to HIV they are immune and it's this rare gene. And so he essentially gives them this immunity with this gene. It's much easier to make babies uh, 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 immune to the parents HIV by washing the sperm or other such things. But anyway, so he does this, right? So his claim is that there are no deletions zero complex mutations, zero ramifications of it. Do you believe this? Well, and, and I think we should emphasize that. So, so I think a lot of news stories, they say CRISPR is this highly precise, amazing gene editing tool. The truth yeah, is no, that surgery. there's, it's, it's, and gene surgery, I mean, all of these things, there's actually been a debate on Twitter on like maybe the, the use of these terms themselves is- Are dangerous. Are dangerous because it's giving Misleading. the impression that, you know, it's like a scalpel and you can change one letter for another. It is not actually that easy in practice. There are things that have become incredibly easy. Like if you want to make a knockout mutation, you want to do a genetics experiment in a mouse, in a human cell line, and you want to just get rid of a gene, CRISPR is fantastic for that. Even if the editing is not perfect, it's good enough for that. But if you want to talk about making a therapeutically um, safe edit or mutation, it's not ready for prime time. I mean, you cannot go in and make 100% this letter to that letter. That's still beyond the reach of current technology. So I think it's really important to, to be aware that there's a big spectrum of what CRISPR can do, and it, it doesn't make it any less powerful, but I think there are different factors at play when you talk about being ready for therapeutic mm -hmm. clinical use. Are you concerned that there are these, Ali, I feel like you have an opinion on this. Are yeah, you so concerned I, that there so, are these uh, girls who are living, right. so, who have had this happen to them without consent, let yeah. alone yeah. all kinds of other yeah. issues? So, so let's take a step back for a second and, and evaluate you know, this is science, and, and science is bound to scrutiny, and it's called peer review, 
where if I go out in the street and say, hey, I've cured cancer, it would create a lot of noise and people would be very interested, but it really doesn't mean anything until somebody can reproduce my protocol. This is the way science works. You can claim anything you want until somebody else shows that they're following exactly the steps that you define, you can reach the same output, is not valid. So as far as I know, Dr. Her's paper was never published and hasn't been peer reviewed. A lot of things have been said about his work and I have no way of evaluating based on unpublished information to what extent this is true or not true. And somehow the fact that nobody can have access to the kids, to the girls, so that you, can actu you cannot actually sequence their DNA and look if it really is uh, CCR5 correction or was there any off-target effects the way you're suggesting. In the absence of this kind of evidence, everything else remains a speculation. If you were to do this experiment in any other animal model systems, may it be, again, frogs or, or mouse, what you will very quickly see is when you inject the tools for CRISPR-Cas9 in an embryo, you don't get a global effect in all the cells. You get this thing called mosaicism, where some of the cells have the CRISPR-Cas9 edition and then the other ones don't. And is as far as we can tell so far, is seems to be a random process. So I would not believe personally any of these claims until I see the evidence that somehow the human embryo is different than any other model system, and I welcome that, I have no problem mm -hmm. with accepting that, but until that is proven, then I don't think that uh, any serious conclusion can be done. And it's important to put this in the context of the fact that Dr. Ho also started about 20 different companies at the same time in China, and the announcement was done the day before the IPO which is a bizarre oh, coincidence to me. to me. Yeah, it's, it's well, a very I think interesting... this is an interesting question for Michal, because you're talking as a, um, a Westerner, um, an American, uh, I, and, and thinking about what our regulations are, what our rules are. How do you deal with the rogue experimenters um, when it's so cheap and easy. It is one thing when it requires a billion dollars and we have so our sights only on heads of state in certain countries like nuclear weapons or you know culling plutonium or uranium. When you have something that is this cheap and easy that I can order a kit and edit my pink yeast, um, how, what is, what is your feeling as uh, from the industry side and how to control this and what, what the implications of that are if, if the rest of the world can go ahead regardless of what our ethics may be. So, so it's interesting because I think that um, there are other very scary um, biological tools or weapons and, uh, and um, that, that are out there, you know, uh, very dangerous viruses and bacteria. And I mean, if, you, if we want to become really kind of uh, raise the anxiety here with the audience, I think uh, just thinking about everything that is out there is pretty scary. And somehow um, we managed to, you know, control these things uh, with, with some sense of responsibility and some regulatory. And I, and I think the reaction... Um, it seems to me that, that there was the appropriate reaction to this experiment worldwide. It was not just uh, the U.S. that condemned it. Was, so um, I have, you know, in general, I, I, I'm an optimist. I, I don't know if it's like the, the industry perspective, but, um, but I think that I'm optimistic about this. I think the, the world has had many opportunities to kind of blow up and somehow we're still here tonight, thankfully. Um, so, uh, so I would say that, um, you know, yes, there is this chance that, that we would see, you know, ROG experiments, um, but I think the opportunities there has been with, with other tools as well. I think that uh, in terms of actually translating um, the, um, this discovery into therapeutics, you know, we will see additional generations of technology. I mean, the original, the original uh, founders, uh, for example, of Editas Medicine, which is one of the three human therapeutics um, uh, companies based on CRISPR-Cas9, 
um, have already started beam therapeutics, which is, uh, you know, taking a kind of a more precise approach uh, that is uh, uh, enhancing the, the uh, you know, uh, the, the precision, the, uh, the ability to really target single nucleotides. I think we're going to see a flurry of those. And so... Um, I, 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 as I said, I, I think it's, a, it's a definitely a very disruptive discovery, but there will be some evolution. Uh, how we control this, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a global society, I really don't have the, the answer to this. I mean, I wish I, I did. Um, as a, you know, somewhat a naive person who's been following uh, science, you know, as it unfolded, you know, I... Um, I was part of, you know, human genome sequence uh, efforts, right? And I remember being interviewed um, on, on national public radio the day that the human, you know, human um, uh, genome uh, sequencing was finalized. And I was attacked brutally by, by the person who was interviewing me and said, you know, what do we need this thing? I mean, it just leads to women having to, you know, to have surgery to remove their breasts and their uterus because you can't give us solutions. So we're now, you know, a couple decades later, we're starting to see some solutions. I mean, there is a big journey ahead of us, um, you know, uh, and, and, um, and I think that in general, we see a lot of responsibility. I think the example here of how the scientific community is regulating itself, uh, it, at least in the U.S., and how other countries have decided to use policy and, and law and, and, and to, to enforce discipline is uh, encouraging to me. I think um, um, one way perhaps to move forward is, and I agree that it has to be an international approach to it, is not to let these kind of decisions um, in the hand of scientists alone. I think there is a, a serious conflict here, and, and uh, I think it's very important that this resolution and this debate uh, includes all layers of the society. And, and to a large extent, I will even argue that scientists in this debate should be acting as ex officio, sitting there to provide information, but not necessarily uh, expressing transformative way of leading this forward, because by definition, we're seeing things differently. And I think it will have to be an international debate, because at the end of the day, it always comes back to the same question, which address the origin of life and the, the origin of a human being. So when does life begin? When do we consider an embryo to be a human? At what point does an, a natural or an artificial synthetic embryo deserves uh, recognition of moral status? These are questions that are dealt with differently in different cultures, in different religions, and it's very important to respect all point of views, especially in multicultural society like the one we're living in. And you know, some of these debates also in the case of uh, early embryonic development is linked to the abortion arguments. You know, it's the same kind of questions that kind of resurface. How late is it okay to do this? What is the definition of a human being? When does this begin? Yeah. If you consider the main or five religions in the society in which we're living in, and you ask the authorities, well, when does life begin? You will find completely different opinions depending on what spectrum of belief you're coming from. So the Catholics will tell you it's conception. So that picture behind me is a human being. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it starts at the first cell cycle and it continues to move onward. Protestants have shared that feeling to some extent, but also have a little bit of divergence around the decors. If you ask, um, the Jewish community, well, when does the Torah says life begins? And the answer is very clear, is at heartbeat. Heartbeat is 40 days after fertilization. 40 days, okay? So let's check with the Muslims. What does Islam think? What does the Quran say about the origin of life? Heartbeat, 40 days, wow. For once they agree, well, that's, that's cool. It's <laughs> once. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, they used to agree a lot about 4,000 years ago, but right, anyway. <laughs> right, and, then, and then, the, then, then, you know, the Buddhists and the Hindus have their own complete things. Uh, some Buddhists believe that for as long as you're attached to somebody else with an umbilical cord, you're not a human being. Human, humanity is defined, origin of life is defined by, is defined by independence. The, the minute the cord 
is caught, and then the Hindus toss their arm in the air and say, I don't even understand your question because there is no beginning or end. You know, today you're a human, tomorrow you're a tiger and then a butterfly. And, <laughs> and so in a circle, there is no origin and there is no end. So that question is, so that's why I think it's very important to have this debate, not only in the in international sitting or multicultural sitting where we respect and acknowledge everybody else's opinion, especially those that are against our own, but also that the scientists do not take the leading role in this debate and allow those expression to develop and blossom. Initiating the debate, I think, is more important than the outcome of the yeah. debate at the other end. And, and, and I think you, that there, is a, there is another very important axis, which is uh, really uh, what justifies intervention, right? I mean, is it... Uh, the, the desire to have a more beautiful baby? Uh, is, it, is, it the, you know, is it really formal disease? You know, where does disease, where does a condition or a disease start and a quality of life, you know, ends and you know, so on and so forth. So I think that's a really important one because I think as a society, we would say if we can actually save a life or we can, you know, change dramatically the trajectory of a life from misery and suffering to good health, which uh, I think you, you have a good movie for that. Yeah, well, um, I, I'm actually, I'm just going to declare that these movies, we're just going to run them because we're running out of time. They're going to run, they're going to run gorgeously in the background while we talk, <laughs> as opposed to pa pausing to think about them. But actually, Michal, this is exactly the point I wanted to turn to next, which is that what defines a vanity project from a health project. So for instance, one of the uh, major motivations that the scientist cites in China for having done this experiment to actually bring these children to fruition is the uh, ego of the father. That in China, to be unable to reproduce for whatever reason, maybe it, it be that he has HIV, um, is, is uh, an assault to his manliness. So is this a vanity project or is I it mean, a health project? I think he was so, misled in this particular so, so opportunity. So consent yes. is another huge so, issue. So may, maybe actually to. bringing a, a pharma perspective here is, is, is actually relevant because I think that um, uh, in the US, okay, you can develop a treatment for a condition, for a disease, and it's well defined. So we cannot develop a drug for aging for example, because aging is not a disease. We cannot uh, develop a drug for beauty because beauty is not, you know, or you know, lack of beauty is not a disease. <laughs> so I think, I think society but has... But people do, though. We t you mentioned people. Botox earlier, and you can talk about aging. Medic you can buy plenty of things in the vitamin store that are for aging. Look, so the vanity projects no, yes, are probably the most lucrative, aren't they? I, oh, absolutely. And I, I think that, and this is totally not uh, related to any, any, you know, my formal position, but I, I think people, you know, for beauty, for intelligence, for greed, for money, they will do a lot. They, they do a lot now. They uh, do plastic surgery. They do Botox. They do, you know, a lot of other things uh, that bring a lot of suffering and are unsafe. Um, and, and I'm not commenting on Botox or, or, or any approved you know, treatment, but I'm just saying there is, there is a, a, a lot of a, a sacrifice that people are willing to, to do this. So in, in some ways, we can ask ourselves, is it better to embrace this technology and, and engage in developing it in the context that we believe as a society are worthy? So to relief, you know, you know a, a recognized, well-defined disease, for example, rather than just leave it for, you know, and say, we're, we're, you know, we're going to try and suppress it or we're going to try to over control it. And, and again, um, because, because I, I suspect that there may be many renegade attempts to harness it for things that, uh, that are, you know, so good question. Again, not for, you know, a single entity to answer. I think as a society, we need to to have the debate and, and consider how to address it. Well, let's go beyond even the vanity project, and this is the last um, sort of idea thrown out there before we open up to Q&A. Um, we are doing Q&A, right? Somebody nodding? Yes, we're doing Q&A. Um, and that is, what about uh, the idea of designing our successors? What if we want to make astronauts with a different bone density who require less food, air, and water, who less sleep, who live longer? I mean, is this something we want to do for space travel? Do we want to design human beings for specific tasks, for specific um, occupations? This is 
actually quite conceivable in this world that we're talking about. And um, and what it, what are the implications of something like that? Is this going to? I mean, you all sound very confident that it won't get out of our hands. But um, on the flip side, we're not under pressure. And we know that as a society, we do strange things under pressure. I'm just going to make a reference to uh, the inventors of quantum mechanics who had no intention, no intention of killing people, no intention of using quantum mechanics. And there's a line in uh, the play Copenhagen where Niels Bohr says to his wife, you know, Margareta, nobody's thought of a way to use quantum mechanics to kill people, right? This is on the eve of the nuclear bomb where in fact they use quantum mechanics to kill people. So are we sure that under pressure and duress that we would not design uh, humanity in these pronged ways? And what are the implications for that? Well, I guess it depends on the definition of what one would call wrong and one would call right. And those definitions are very fuzzy, again, sometimes culturally and different from one to the other. Uh, it's important to note that we actually, as you stated earlier, that the early study of the human embryo uh, allowed us for the first time to discover organs that we never imagined existed. And it's, at least to me, amazing to think of how many of the organs in our anatomy are transient organs that you never see uh, because it develops in the womb and it disappears before birth. Uh, we're beautiful, as I said, after a month, we have a tail, we have a gorgeous tail. Yeah. We have, we <laughs> have gills. gills. We, Fascinating. We actually breathe in water. These are natural attributes. These are not CRISPR-Cas9 mediated changes. These are, the information is within our DNA as we speak right now. That information has been silenced and that opened up this keyboards were playing this harmony within a given window of time. And then that, that music ended and something else started. But the information is still there. Uh, it's not impossible to imagine, and in fact, I like to think that it's absolutely possible to reawaken that information. So we make babies, we tell them, keep your girls. No, but if, you know, <laughs> things are changing in, in, in our universe, right? So. Uh, I don't know where climate change is going to take us or what other natural or non-natural disasters are going to happen. But it would be nice to think that maybe somehow we'll have a way of dealing with it if we really had to, mm -hmm. without having to think about it being wrong or being right, but just using instinctive uh, um, reaction or almost reflex of survival. So this is something that is not only a luxury of talking about what makes us more beautiful or less beautiful or vanity, but perhaps what would make us survive if we really need to, and I can assure you, there might come a day that we will need that technology. Mm -hmm. And Sam, right or wrong, what do you think about the idea that we'll differentiate the human species using CRISPR in the future for the benefit of the greater society or otherwise? Wow. Wow, yeah. that's it, thank you. <laughs> um, <I'll> converge. <laughs> yeah, I, I often don't know whether to I mean, I think time is, we, we talked about time moving backwards or earlier, and, and I think about time moving forwards, and I mean, it's impossible to really fathom a thousand years, a hundred thousand years, and we are looking at, I mean, how many years until we discovered this technology mm -hmm. to there being two baby girls Less than a decade? halfway around the world whose genomes have been forever changed. And, and the whole point about this being heritable is that if those two girls have children, that entire lineage of humans from those two individuals will forever carry the scars or the marks genome. of this designed mutation that Dr. Ha installed. So, so on a time scale at which we're going to live and die and our children will live and die, I mean, our world's not getting any different because of CRISPR for human uses. I think we haven't talked about gene drives and there's probably not enough time to go there, but I think there are other parts of CRISPR that might even be more concerning on a short time scale. But I mean, 100,000 years, a million years, I mean, if humans are able to stick around that long, I think the days when, when it's just natural sexual reproduction that leads to the next generation, those are over. I mean, it's 2% of births in the US today are by IVF, 2%. There's 250 people here, so in 50 years, one out of 50 at least 
Mm-hmm. Uh, did I just get the math wrong? I forget yeah, what I said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wasn't. That's all right. I'm we're not we're good. To recover from That's it. like five people here. Five yeah, people here fine. at IVF. I actually can't I do, can math, do math. I promise. <laughs> it's my thing. <laughs> um, but I mean, and that's continuing to rise. And, and there's this whole question of, well, if you could now use IVF, and we haven't talked about genetic testing, but now it's become a fairly routine procedure to subject fertilized embryos to genetic testing before they're implanted. And you can compare a batch of embryos that are produced in the lab and choose the one with the most favorable genetic profile. Mostly now you're looking for chromosomal abnormalities, so just getting the right numbers of chromosomes. But the technology is 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 getting better and better. And soon you're going to be able to say, here's a, a panel of genes and gene variants that the two parents can contribute. So even without CRISPR, I think we're going to see yeah. a changing so, world in that regard. So I, I, I forbid myself usually from getting the last word before you open to Q&A, yes. but I have to do this. <laughs> um, I love what you're describing and expressing. I was uh, once in a similar conversation with, with somebody who I won't identify who's a brilliant, brilliant geneticist, and somebody from the audience said, um, well, wouldn't you eliminate autism if you could? And he said, I'm autistic. Okay, and I that was like a moment. So what do you mean genetically superior embryo? Do we know what that means? Do we look at that embryo and say, that embryo has autism? Okay, and there goes one of the greatest minds of our time. Um, And uh, on that weird note, (laughs) I would love to open this up to questions and also maybe first please thank our guests and uh, and let's open up to Q&A. Thank you. Um, And there's a mic running around. If you have a mic, ask a question. Or if you're at a mic and you have a mic, ask a question, please. And keep those mics in play. As soon as someone's asked a question, grab it off them and move it around the room. Okay, mics are in play. Somebody's getting one in the back and somebody's getting one in the front. Whoever gets it first. first, (coughs) Thank you. Uh, Oh, somebody's got it. Yes, please. uh, You know, this is, it's said that science fiction is, today's science fiction is tomorrow's science. And, uh, and the topic of this is existential. Uh, and I'm just wondering what memory plays in our uh, epigenic inheritance. How do you, how, what do we know about memory and, and, its, and its role? Yeah, if you'll permit me, I think that's a really interesting question. So the idea of even CRISPR and epigenetics is that you put into the genome a memory of your experience, whether you're a bacterium or a human. So what does that mean about inheriting memory? So memory is a, it's a very interesting concept on its own. We, we define it as, as human beings, as adults, of what is it that we remember in short term and long term. But memory occurs at the molecular level, as already stated by you and by the person who's asking the question. Uh, epigenetic is considered to be a memory at the DNA level. But you can also zoom out from this. And we recently, and I think it was two months ago, published a paper where we showed that during embryogenesis, cells remember where they come from and they react based on the history of what they have experienced. So when we talk about epigenetic memory in this particular case, we're talking about the allowance of a DNA molecule to remember a history that is either based on his line- on her lineage or his lineage, but also in the environment in which the cells was growing. Those epigenetic uh, signatures, as they're called, can be inherited also, but they're very plastic to changes. And that's exactly what you want if you want to be adaptive to the environment that you cannot control. So natural selection is based on selecting uh, individuals with the traits that can adapt to random variations. And that plasticity of memory is a built-in and is a great thing that is there because otherwise, I think we have not made it, certainly not to this podium and certainly not in the audience. Um, it's hey, a, just a, uh, another, yeah. I mean, this is maybe a little more philosophical, but I, I think that uh, we need to remember that, uh, you know, we're sitting here and we're products of nature and nurture, right? And, uh, and uh, a lot of who we are uh, is determined by our, the sequence of experiences that we went through. Um, you know, I'm focused a lot, you know, mostly on disease and most diseases, you know, have a small genetic component and a very, very large uh, you know, uh, uh, nurture element and, and environmental 
um, and exposure uh, elements to them. So I think that, uh, you know, and memory is, is you know, th this is a type of memory. I mean, you know, all of the uh, history that, that human beings uh, um, go through. And I think that has a lot of relevance for the CRISPR question and, and the, uh, you know, the baby design because, um, you know, we know that twins, you know, raised in different circumstances will end up different people. So I, I think that we, we also, it, 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 you know, you, your question actually triggers a thought that says, you know, it's not so deterministic, right? I mean, even if we decide to, you know, there is, you know society chooses to... It's not just the genome. It's not just the genome. Um, there is somebody else has a mic up in front here. Yes. There's so much going through my head, but thank you so much for the talk. Um, how you ended off with uh, what about autism? Uh, surely we would get rid of that thing. Um, same thing for like trisomy tests. Like surely we would not have children with Down syndrome. Um, one of the questions that um, I've come across over and over and just like thinking about bioethics and where we're going is this idea of, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, um, this idea that like a family who is uh, blind or deaf going through IVF is choosing um, the embryo um, that is blind or deaf uh, for the reason that uh, they would like to have a child that is like them. Um, it's a community. We don't want to be uh, that different, uh, whatever that means. Um, how do we go about thinking about um, this scenario? Um, I don't know if I have the right words to put it more precisely than just that, um, but uh, in the context of IVF and these ideas of disability or ability, um, ableism as a, uh, a thing, um, how do we, how do we, how do we yeah, tackle so that? It is true that in the deaf community that they, they, there is a sense of welcoming deaf children, being excited and happy to have deaf children because they're part of the community and they speak the language. So what, how do you feel if a, um, two deaf parents come in and choose embryos specifically to be hearing Im impaired? I mean, Sam, do you have a So I, I think you put it very eloquently and uh, I didn't mean to imply or support or kind of promote the use of genetic testing of embryos. I just was making the point that this is that's where Something we are. that's available now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think disability rights is a major stakeholder in this issue. And I think, you know, that's one of the more ethical or philosophical concerns that the, the idea of being able to select the genetics of your child will now promote the idea that there are certain children with genetics that are better than others. Um, you know, I sometimes when I'm lecturing to, to kind of high school students or people at that level, I often play this clip from um, Gattaca, which has this very kind of eerie scene from 20 years ago that is so more relevant today, which where the doctor is basically saying, I've gone ahead and eliminated any predisposition to addiction, alcoholism, um, obesity, and, and it's kind of scary to me that, you know, I think the, the silver lining is that most traits are not explained by single genes, and so you're not going to have a genetic variant that's going to make you smarter or dumber. I mean, that, does, that is a fiction that will remain a fiction forever. So there's a certain limit to what you can even predict from genetics, but that, the problem is not going to go away. And, and companies like 23andMe, when you have millions of, of consumer genotypes, and you can now correlate those with statistics, you know, on, on a large panel of different traits. I mean, there are more and more genetic associations being published every day in the literature. And, and so I, I don't know, I think there's no answer to that, but it's certainly a, a very legitimate and pressing concern. And it's something that I think about often. Yeah, I can add yes, two, two small uh, additions to what Sam uh, correctly said. One is that there are mutations that are little. For example, if you consider Huntington's disease, this is a single gene mutation with 100% penetrance. That means if you have the mutation, you get the disease. You're out of luck. It's not 40% chance, 60% chance, and if one parent has it, the likelihood of their children having it will is proportional to one, two, or, or the number of mutations that you can count. I think in that particular case, we can agree that if you can correct something that otherwise would not allow the development to continue or the children to 
uh, not die early on, then you can ask yourself, well, if I have a technology that can save life, and if I don't use that technology, is that really ethical? So the ethical argument can go in both directions. I think what we can afford. The second thing is, uh, as, as Sam and others said, is, um, it's impossible to think again one gene, one function. If you think of the keyboard and the music, changing a key on the piano will have consequences that will affect all musics. So one gene that is a function within the first week of development will have a completely different function once the child is born and then even more different, uh, different functions after puberty, let's say. So the idea that we can fix in the case of CCR5 and that done by uh, Dr. Her, that somehow this is gonna fix AIDS completely ignores that CCR5 has functions during early development that are necessary. And Huntington's, uh, um, in your research, if I understand correctly, you find in the embryo, but it doesn't express until adulthood. Exactly. So it's just lying in wait. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, Huntington is not the only case. Mm -hmm. If you have a dominant mutation, which means you only need to affect one of the two copies of the gene in your chromosome, and that mutation ends up in giving rise to lethality, then I will argue that if you don't, if you have the tools to fix it and you don't fix it, then you're not being uh, ethically right side. And Michal, you also had a yeah, comment. Yeah, uh, just a thought here. I think that uh, um, we are, you know, at a, at a very important inflection point in science and in understanding biological mechanisms. And I think the way for us to judge um, how the world will look in the future is, is very limited. So, you know, specifically, I think autism is, is a wonder. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an enigma because it is, you know, to, to classify it as a disease is, is um, you know, is, is very superficial. I mean, I think it's something we don't understand. And I want to say optimistically that uh, there is, a, a, there is a, a lot that we, we don't know about, uh, about biology and the human condition that will unfold in the coming decades, thanks to advances in science like uh, you know CRISPR-Cas9, which allows us, which you kind know, of amplifies our ability to to understand mechanisms. So, I, I think that um, if we just kind of control our, <laughs> our our desire, you know, to uh, kind of go completely out of line, I, I think that uh, the, the future will will create many opportunities to redefine. Um, how we look at, uh, you know, at diversity, how we look at uh, what today seems, that, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, a maybe a disability and, uh, and maybe is a great ability if we just, you know, reframe differently, understood differently and harness differently. So um, uh, I, I'm afraid that we only have time for one more very quick question and we're actually over time, so we don't even have time for that one, but I'm going to do it anyway. Do we have one last question? Anyone yeah, has a mic? Whoever has I a have, mic, it's yours. I have the mic. Um, yeah, so one of the questions that was, or one of the ideas that was brought up was these extra organs that are developed in the embryo, like gills and tails. And I think about pop culture a little bit, and superheroes are a huge thing. One of the things that they develop are these sort of extra special abilities. What, what does science foresee in that perspective that there is within the genetic uh, DNA already you know, beyond what we consider today to be a human, uh, what what could there be for humanity beyond what we consider as a human today? Millions of years of evolution. Uh, again, information is not lost as species have evolved. Uh, it has either been rearranged, sometimes silenced, but never lost. Uh, not too long ago, we published a paper where we showed that you can grow an artificial human embryo inside of a bird's egg side by side with a bird. If you consider that birds are closer to dinosaurs than they are to humans, and the fact that the human embryonic cell or a synthetic human embryo can actually develop within the context of a bird microenvironment, that already tells you that over 500 millions of years of evolutionary distance, the information was never lost. The human cells can talk to the bird cells and the bird cells can talk to the human cells and manage to organize themselves in an independent entity. In one case, a bird, in the other case, a human. And we talked already about those transient organs, gills and tails, and even part of the brain, some of it we still don't understand, that show up for about 48 hours, sometimes 72 hours, in a window of development just to disappear and never to come back again. 
I think those traits, we don't know much about the relevance, but they can be reawakened later on in life, the same way as I can imagine recreating a human gill from adult tissue. I, I mean, we're going to do this all night after. <laughs> There's going to be um, drinks and food upstairs. Everyone's welcome. But before we close, I've been asked to introduce Laura McGarity and Orly Boston from New Lab just to make final closing comments. And, um, and, and before I welcome them on, please let's thank our guests again. All right, so we'll keep this really, really brief. Um, I'm completely mind blown. I don't even know where to begin. My mind is completely swirling. My I'm brain, optimist, my brain hurts. The way. My brain hurts. I am, I'm on the Again. side of the optimist. I think in the right hands, we can do amazing things. Um, but I want to tell us the audience quickly, who has had their genome sequenced here? Has anybody? Okay, not that many. I thought, what's that? Oh, you can hear me. Who's had their de uh, genome sequenced? Yeah, not that many. Okay. I'm sure a lot of that is potentially fear, but I did have mine sequence, which was interesting. Um, anyway, I think the most important thing tonight, and thank you guys so much for this amazing conversation. Jan is just incredible, and you guys each um, really blew my mind with some of the, the research that you're doing and perspective on this. So thank you so much, and the audience for chiming in with amazing questions, as always, and being so engaged. I feel like we should do a CRISPR 2.0 because I feel like we've just scratched the surface of this, so maybe that'll be the next one that we'll do. Um, but we're going to continue the series, and I just want to thank Ernst & Young um, and J-Labs for being amazing partners, and without them funding this and supporting the amplification of these important conversations and topics, none of this would be possible. Um, so, Orlin, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Laura, and again, thank you to our wonderful panelists and uh, our moderator. Uh, it's interesting, this, this is the third of, uh, of a series of four, but we, we're, we're thinking we, we need to do more than four. So yeah. what, what do you guys think? Do you think we should do more than four? Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right, good. That, that's the answer I wanted to hear. But it was interesting, in the first two topics, this particular topic kept coming up, right? And the bioethical uh, uh, issues and, and, and uh, that would come up. Uh, it, it was just interesting. There was a hunger for this particular topic, given what was going on uh, in the media on this. But uh, what we think is most important is to have these forums, create these forums where we bring together people from across the spectrum of healthcare, of life sciences, of medicine, of science, uh, because uh, that's, that's the only way, only way you guys are going to feel supported, right? Uh, like you said, you want to engage others uh, in this. It can't just be the scientists. And so that's what this forum is also about, right? Uh, we want it to be thought-provoking. Uh, we want it to hurt your brains like it hurts my brain from time to time when I'm here. Um, and so we're, gonna, we're committed to doing that. EY is committed to doing that. I know I can speak for, uh, for Johnson & Johnson Innovation, J-Labs, that, again, that is what we were looking to do, Certainly our partner, New Labs. So let's continue to do, to do this and, and shape these debates. So thank you for uh, being with us. Thank you. We've got drinks and cocktails and all sorts of stuff upstairs, so please enjoy. Thanks. Thanks so much.